Greetings comrades and welcome to the Eastern Border. This one is another one of those recorded on Discord because I figured that's the best way how to get your questions to me. Twitter requires a lot of scrolling and oh boy, I've been busy all, mo all month long and today, as it was a more silent day, I uh, had time to check my emails about everything. And some of those questions were less about the current events and more towards my attitude of these events. And I was surprised about some of them, which is why I also hope that you guys will comment because I'll be reading comments from the Hangout chat. And if someone comes in and speaks something, you can do that as well. And for all of you listening just right now, uh, our Discord server is pretty active at this moment and we're doing all sorts of fun activities. You can come in, especially if you're a patron, you get bonuses here. And if you just tell cool stories and hang out with everyone, we're, we're a pretty decent community. At least I like what we're, where, where we're going with this situation. But uh, I'll start with the heavy hitters straight up. First of all, was I was asked about my attitude towards Martyr Made podcast. Yeah, and that was a bit strange because I don't listen to what Martyr Made does about this show lately, about like you know Ukraine war and everything. And I considered him to be considered him to be a friend of mine because you see, when I started out my show, he noticed me back when he was doing the Israeli Palestinian conflict, and he introduced me to Danielle Bolelli and everything. And that was kind of the other end. I knew Dan Carlin, of course, because he pushed me to start the show. But um, Daryl Cooper from Martyr Mate got me into this whole stuff. And he's been giving out some advice and some, you know, good camaraderie as well. And, and now with the war, we are on the opposite sides of the spectrum. And people are just constantly tagging me and posting me about the fact how, you know, how can I still can call him a friend if he reposts things and stuff and and we made a bet I, I think many of you know that me and martyr made we made a bet about the end of this war about who's gonna win he um, agreed on seven to one because of his fans i bet two hundred dollars if ukraine wins we have fourteen hundred dollars and that's going to be spent on a massive barbecue party in odessa we're going to have a place to stay and everything it's going to be cool but the thing is I think it's because of his audience, maybe. I don't know. I think he's gone into some contrarian thing. But I know he's a reasonable man. He just doesn't fact check all the time because he's sent me some things. But I understood that there's no point of arguing at those people. Like I can argue at Girkin and, and stupid Russians and, and you know Russian propaganda spreaders. But Martyr Made and his show, Daryl Cooper, he's a podcaster from the United States and he's very contrarian. But... I believe that to his audience, it is better to be polite and nice and just explain everything rationally. They expect to be yelled upon. They expect to be mistreated. And I approach this with a cold, you know, cold calculated thing. He posts some nonsense. I debunk it very carefully, like he did with the Poland thing. I think that, you know, there's, there's, there's some respect to be gained. If we are to convince more people that we are the right side, we can't afford to be rude. And he has a lot of audience. He's a lot. He's a bigger show than I am by far, anyways. At least, you know, even even at my peak when I had like twenty five thousand followers on Twitter before the ban, he's still like over than double that. And he's a much louder louder name. So I, I don't treat I don't treat those guys as as people whom I need to bonk on the head. I treat them as to be convinced that I know that I have changed opinions of some people. And I know that I would like to be treated with respect if any of you go and argue with his fans. That is a mutual thing there. I, I wanted to put this one out there because, yeah, I disagree with Martyr Mate and I do not know how he came to his conclusions. But I believe that, you know, because of all the personal things he's done for me, I, I think it's better to just not yell at him and just explain slowly and be reasonable and rational about this. Another thing is, for example, um, Andrew Heaton from Political Orphanage. These guys are great. And Andrew does not kind of sh share my opinion exactly. He wants a deal sometimes but i really like how our discussions on, on political orphanage have turned out with andrew because he disagrees with me sometimes but he listens to me and and he's respectful about it and he always looks for peace so peaceful solutions and that's that's another thing i again i i can disagree with him but at least for political orphanage i can say that he's done a lot to help my help this show out especially when i was in trouble and you know he, he's the kind of reasonable guy with whom whom you could reasonably argue against they're not spreading russian propaganda outright at least political orphanages and martyr sometimes does that which is 
which makes me surprised to be honest but what can i do it's kind of a it's kind of you're seeing your old friend doing stupid stupid things and but i i can't push myself to, to just you know be angry and hate him because once again, I do believe that this specific audience, they are to be convinced not to be yelled at. Uh, another question that came out, and I'll get to your questions uh, in the chat here later on. Another question is that uh, I will not comment on United States politics ever. I did that in the earlier days. I have done that before, and it all, all ended up badly because I just end up knowing that I don't know enough about the situation. And I can only comment on United States politics insofar as this concerns this part. I've been, I've been taken out of context. It's been bad. So please, those questions are out, out of limits. It's just that I can say the things that I know, that I can understand, but not the things that I, I would need to speculate upon. A visit to the United States, but I, I don't even know why you want me to comment on all this situation. I, like, I, I, know, I know basically that uh, Biden has issues, Trump has issues, everyone has issues, but uh, I don't want to take a partisan stance on anything. Because again, I, I know that you guys are, well, very partisan in your country, and I do not know nearly enough about United States politics. I have some opinions, which I sometimes share, but uh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not getting into this mess, especially since some, some unfriendly people who might be very, very close friends with Russian propaganda might use this against me, and, and I just don't need that in my life. I'd rather not, you know. I stay to my specialty and, and, and what I know about. I'm just still surprised about all that. Uh, finally, a question about advertising again from the big ones that were kind of meta level. Advertising in Patreon. I uh, I think, you know, I've charged more on Patreon this month than, than the previous months because I had to skip two articles and I warned everyone about this. But I do not charge for every episode and I warned beforehand. And then if I charge a bit more one month, I charge less the next one. It's all based on the whole effort thing and what needs to be done. I try to be honest about this. Uh, please set your monthly limits on Patreon. As I charge per episode, you can simply set monthly limit, and then you don't pay over that monthly limit ever. That's a good option. And uh, I'm not switching over to per month because, again, when I started out the show, per month seemed kind of silly because I started learning from Dan Carlin, and I didn't think that I would even release an episode every month, and I didn't want to make people pay for months when I didn't release an episode. It was a different kind of atmosphere back then. So I started per episode thing. But now to switch to a per month system would mean that I would lose all of my Patreons instantly and everyone would have to resubscribe. Obviously, a lot of people would not. And I can't afford that risk right now. I might, when peaceful times come, I might do this, but it's a mess. So just set your monthly limits and, and just, I, I'm, I'm not trying to rob you of, of stuff. It's just that I got a lot of complaints about this. About the advertisements, I do not control the ads except the ones that I, you know, sometimes speak about myself, which are usually Latvian companies. I have a meeting with one of them. That's a weird permacost thing, I think. They're called permacost and they are a podcast app that where you upload your podcast and then if you listen it there, then I get some sort of cyber token thing. I don't know. I'm not that into crypto. But, uh, you know, they're a Latvian company. I do not need to break any laws or any other deals to get into with them. So I'll, I'll try out that one out. I will not be peddling any NFTs or any of that nonsense. I'm just, you know, Latvian company came and offered me to maybe extra monetize the show. So I am because I'm trying to find ways how to, you know, cost less for my patrons. And also, I'm not sure if you've heard them, but technically you should be hearing United States election political ads. I, ACOST offered me to advertise political parties, and I, as a pure mercenary, clicked that I will advertise all of them all the time. Very much tied to the point why I, why I do not comment on, on political events. I just want to make it clear I'm doing this because, well, that's a big buy, and I would rather go on which one I need, not go anywhere else. I'm not taking any sides. I'm not commenting on that. I'm focusing on what I know. But uh, yeah, if you in your state hear my show running ads for whatever candidate, including third party ones, I'm doing this for the money and I'm being open about this. It's just that they offered and I'm, I was like, sure, I hope this does not offend anyone. I'm at least blatantly honest about my position here. And uh, any other ads, I do not control them. They just insert them depending on your state, your territory, whatever, whatever you're located in. I have had uh, people telling me that I've been advertising Reuters. At one point, I advertised Lockheed Martin. Then it was some sort of Saudi Arabian companies. I have no control over this. 
It's just ACOS does things. And ACOS, by the way, takes away a huge percentage of my ads and I'm trying to kind of move away from them, but with Stitcher doing things, oh, it's a mess. If I had a better system, how to monetize all this stuff, and if I had time and someone to help me figure this stuff out, that'd be better off. But, you know, it is what it is during this war. Let's just say I, let's just say I do not mind completely if you just uh, listen to the show from Patreon site or from webpage and just skip the ads. It like it, It's not of importance to me. I'd rather you hear some good information. That's that's for the big ones. And I really was surprised when, when people asked me about other shows. Yeah, I'm collaborating with everyone that comes on. I believe with the message and things. And I don't do this for fun. I do this because I can. And I I'm suddenly have grown being qualified enough. It's a mission for me. And I'm truly thankful to all, all of you, dear supporters, patrons, and otherwise who've helped me reach this point that I can fully dedicate myself to doing this. Sometimes I actually get a day off like I did today, which was nice. But uh, now we have some questions from the chat and Discord link will be somewhere around there. It's always on Twitter. You're always welcome here. People are much more friendlier than, I don't know, anywhere else. And you'll probably hear some good arguments. Now, I have some questions from Patreons. Patreons questions go first. Mm. Is the fact that Putin is sticking with Shoigu an indication that he knows the military is constrained and that this is the best they can do or an indication of extreme corruption and favoritism? Yeah, I, I specifically read about this today. The problem is what, what Putin apparently has learned from all the situation is the fact that Prigozhin, someone who was like new blood, who wasn't from the old ones, from the cooperative, or the lay cooperative, cooperative Ozira, yeah, he's learned that he can't trust anyone. He's learned that, you know, he has to pick even more loyal people with even less ambition. Someone who just doesn't even have any hopes of going higher. He's learned that he has to surround himself with total loyalists. Like, recently he's been going around and giving awards to Rosgvardia and some soldiers and everyone for stomping down on the Prigozhin's revolution. But the question happens, what did they stomp down on? There were cops there and Rosgvardia people and soldiers around who did nothing. Some of them saluted Prigozhin's force. And, and they were like stayed at home drinking some booze. He's not he's not secure about loyalty of his other guys. So Prigozhin has to stay. Sort of Ekin is doubtful. That's why I think he might actually be arrested. So he's now going to try to do even more loyalist stuff. Shoigu is his buddy. They go uh, on camping trips to Shoigu where they drink reindeer blood together and, and do things because Shoigu is from Siberia. So he's not going to go anywhere because he is first and foremost loyal. And loyal psychophants is the only thing that Putin cares about. That's the, that's the issue here. Another one. Uh, do I see? Do you see any realistic scenario where Ukraine concedes territory and where there is an actual peace treaty? Russia wins the war, or is something along the lines of a frozen war with no peace treaty the best Russia can hope for? Uh, yeah, I think I think a frozen war scenario. But the frozen war scenario happened from 2014 to 2018, so no one wants that. No one in Russia wants that for well, the pro-war people don't want it there. And Ukraine Ukraine wants to get Russians out of all of their territory back to 1991 borders. I honestly do not know what would happen there. I, I personally believe that this thing is going to evolve where Russia is going to have enough internal problems where they just withdraw their troops to the border and you know send the army or whatever to deal with their own internal struggles. I believe it's going to be a fizzling out thing then Russia is going to have their own major issues. And after those issues, some sort of a peace deal might be signed. But for the first part, by the way, uh, before Russia is going to sign any peace deals with Ukraine, I'd say a peace deal with Japan would be nice first. Because remember, Russia has not signed a peace deal with Japan. They're technically you know, still at this frozen Cold War thing. That's a bit sad, but you know, it is what it is. Another question, comrade, what will be the first thing after after that uh, shithole country falls apart? Yeah, I'm, I'm reading them as is. Well, the thing, the first thing that's going to happen is going to be the falling apart process. And I can tell you exactly what, what the first region that's going to fall apart will be. Uh, remember, Putin today, after all these important things, right, after all these important visits and, and, and after important events with Prigozhin, where did he go? He go to talk, went to talk about tourism in Dagestan, in the Caucasus region. Dagestan is also closely tied with Chechnya, because he knows he has to pacify those guys. Because if Putin goes away, Ramzan Kadyrov immediately splits off from Russia, because anyone else, be it radical, conservative, leftist, anyone else who would 
not be Putin, no matter what political leaning, would instantly put Ramzan Kadyrov in prison. He's done so much, so much, and, and he's been threatening higher court justices. He's done so much evil that Ramzan Kadyrov will be gone from Russia the moment Putin is gone. No matter what gets who gets power, unless he himself can maybe make a play for it. But if he does, then there's definitely a massive civil war happening. The thing is, yeah, Ramzan Kadyrov leaves, and then what? Then Tatarstan, and other places. And and what are people going to do? Pay reparations? I think the first thing that's going to happen when we're finally seeing things blow up is either Ramzan Kadyrov making a power play for for something and fighting against the Club of Angry Patriots, or just declaring his own independence in Chechnya. Which is also going to be problematic because everyone hates Ramzan Kadyrov in Chechnya as well. That's interesting. Another question. What's going on with Survikin? Did he assist Prigozhin? Is he missing or arrested? His daughter said today he's fine. Um, well, his daughter might say many things. I remember that Putin also said that he has nothing to do with Wagner. Then we found out that he totally is. Survikin, well, he did, if you remember, uh, like let out a media clip about how this whole Prigozhin stuff was going on, and he recommended Prigozhin lay down his arms, but that was the meekest, meekest thing ever. He, he appealed to things. It seemed like he wanted to make a little tiny peace deal himself with Prigozhin. It did not sound like a general who was trying to crush, crush down on, on, on the mutiny. Nothing like that. And Prigozhin, and the, as they were sort of tied with Prigozhin, I bet he's being investigated. Yeah, why not? I'm not sure if he's going to be arrested or something, because... Putin does not like to arrest people or openly fire things. So I think he's going to be promoted to Antarctica. That's a weird thing. Also, another comment here is about uh, how, how the United States uh, are stating that uh, Surovikin did not know about this and all this stuff. Yeah, no one's going to believe that that much. One thing that I have to praise the United States for is one thing that they did is they made it clear that West was not involved in the situation. I think that was a great play. What else do we have here? Would NATO's reaction to ukraine russia war be different if the Secretary General of NATO would come from an Eastern European country? Would it be more alarmist than now, or would NATO take an even more stiffer stance than, than they already have now? Well, you see, Jens Stoltenberg, he knows his... his uh, Eastern Europe very well. If I'm not mistaken, then uh, I think he was from Iceland, right? No, Norway. Sorry, Norway. He knows. He knows what's up. Uh, of course, you know his country also shares a border with um, with Russia. But why did I think Iceland? I don't even know. But like, yeah, he's from he's from Norway. Previous one was from Denmark. Uh, the Scandinavian guys are smart. They know they know what, what's going on, and uh, they have had a lot of NATO exercises. I think the fact that Norway is there helped us a lot. If if NATO, if NATO General Secretary, which is also just a weird name for him, would be for, for example, say I don't know Spain, then I would be then I would be worried. But Norwegians, uh, yeah, I, I know that they are also in quite close ties with our our people here in the Baltics. I've had heard comments from Norwegian military guys who had trained together with Latvian sapper units, for example, and they gave good good uh, reviews on how our sapper teams are working. So that's pretty great. And I think Stoltenberg is a pretty balanced choice. See, he, he knows enough about Eastern Europe um, to understand us, and he's Western enough to be actually listened to by, um, by the West. I think if we would have like a, a Polish NATO general secretary, I think the West would be kind of less interested in listening to him. Because you see, if, if, if a Norwegian says something about Russia, then it the West will take it more seriously rather than if I do or if Poland does. So I think that we, we got it with a, with a good leader. Yeah, Eastern Europe Eastern Europe leaders would be kind of less reliable on, uh, on all that stuff. Uh, Bart is asking about body doubles. Uh, we have, um, so last week, well, the war correspondents had to go in quarantine before the interview with Putin, and yesterday Putin hugged all sorts of people during his visit to Dagestan. Was this a body double? Pretty much, yeah. I think yes. Basically, I agree with Igor Girkin here. Because he states that, you know, even in Christmas Mass, during Christmas Mass, Putin, if you watch that video, Putin was alone in the church. Even priests, Orthodox priests, were afraid to even move close to him, much less, you know, not, not, not going too close. And he still uses the big table and everything. He's super paranoid about, about all the situation. I'm pretty sure that whatever he, he has to speak in public with, in front of a lot of people and be close to someone, that, that could quite as well be a body double. It's pretty blatant at this point when, when he's learned to teleport. 
and break the break the kind of rules of physics as well. That's all weird. Wisp, by the way, the guy who helps out with uh, a lot of modding issues here on this channel. And uh, he asked me, what are the plans for the podcast and myself when the war is over? Well, depends on when that is. And Belarus is going to happen. I have plans for, as a journalist, plans for the podcast and plans for... I'm going to take a month-long month vacation. I'll be honest with you. I'll take a month-long vacation, go somewhere warm. Then I'll, of course, take a look at the rebuilding process and what's going to happen in Belarus, because that whole thing might also be tying, tied into us. I'd like to get back to making some historical episodes for the podcast. And I definitely will want to, but I'll make less episodes than now, obviously. It's going to be like once a week episodes about history and, and some political events when they happen, or if the other conflict pops in, some Soviet history and things that I wanted to make this show about, like I'm going to be revisiting the Space Race series and all this stuff. And then I'm going to be working on my PhD and writing a book as well. The show's not going to go anywhere. It might be changing a bit of a format, but uh, yeah, it's going to stay here. It's going to focus on things and who knows, maybe I'll go someplace else. It's just that this podcast is a platform, and I'll I'll try to make sure that everyone's you know doing fine. A lot of plans, but for now, a lot of plans that I want to do. But for now, I have to finish through with this situation. Will we see a change in the military leadership? When uh, I'm I'm presuming you're you're talking about Russia. Uh, you will not see a change in the military leadership until Putin is in power. Nothing's going to change there. He's uh, stuck with the guys. And, and his loyalists, nothing's going to change. The fact that uh, Shoigu wasn't wasn't changed away shows that Putin is le has learned to double down, and we are going to see no changes over there. In Ukraine, well, I don't know. Zeljuzny seems to be very competent, so that's pretty nice. Uh, another question: If AFU are making gains of 0 0.5 to 1.5 kilometers per day using only three of their not battalions, brigades, I think we're talking about brigades. And then for their offensive, what are they looking for before deploying the rest of their offensive forces? Uh, th this thing, okay, I can speak about this here because I'm pretty sure none of the Russian guys understand English as well. That's NATO strategy here. They're, they're touching things out. They want to keep the enemy guessing. There will be a Schwerpunkt using World War II military uh, terminology. But the uh, thing is, if, if they attack with everything all at once, then Russians also know where to, where to kind of focus their their defenses. Right now, these kilome kilometers per day, they seem like nothing, but they add up. They're chomping down on the front piecemeal. They're, mo they're making some good progress, but they're not... They're, that's kind of like the saying, you know, if, if you put a, a... If you put a frog in water, and you put it to boiling, the frog will jump out, and it's going to be a lot of trouble. But if you slowly, patiently turn up the heat very slowly, then, you know, you can boil the frog alive, and it won't jump out. It's part of the NATO military strategy of, of how it operates. Because they've, they're trying to focus on the things that they can do, and they're doing quite well at this point. The very fact that they're making this solid progress is nice. And of course, you know, they couldn't get the element of surprise ready when the whole operation started. So now they have to manufacture their own element of surprise. And, well, I, for one, have some ideas on where Ukrainians are going to strike and when. But I'd rather not talk about them openly before there is exact time. Now then, another question. After the events that unfolded during midsummer and shortly thereafter, do you think we will see belated aftershocks in Russia during the next year and beyond? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely we will. Because Putin's elites, you know, the extra day in Moscow, by the way, I heard, uh, the extra three day in Moscow was there so that everyone in the kind of offices, all the clerks could just come back from their plane rides away so that they could back to work and pretend everything's normal. And these people are like, you know, openly stating, oh, everyone was with Putin all the time. It was all close and clear cut. But no, no, a lot of people were, were keeping silent. Margaret Simonyan, for example, said nothing. A lot of people said nothing, wanted to see where the, where the, where the dice will fall, so to speak. And the fact that they're now praising Putin openly, uh, yeah, it's a complex issue. They don't like this as much in, in, in Russian society. People have seen that there are those who care, for example, my economist uh, friend who's been like on the show once very long time ago, Dmitry Potapenko, he stated that uh, Russia has no laws anymore. It doesn't matter. There, there is not a lawful society. And they're worried. They're worried that Putin is weak. They're worried that they might lose anything. And uh, like the soldiers, the Russian pilots who were left to, to rot, basically, because not like their families are going to get compensations that much. And their deaths are just you know, not going to be avenged by anyone because Prigozhin is no longer a criminal. 
yeah, you know, everyone, even the Shilaviki, even the forest structures, even if you work there, you can uh, basically... <laughs> This means that yeah, everyone everyone can be thrown under the bus. This definitely is going to cause reverberations, especially knowing that uh, in March twenty in March twenty twenty four there is a presidential election, as farcical as it may seem. And I think elite might use this. We clearly haven't seen the last of of everything. And now Ogrim, like her nickname, says that I'm Norwegian. Just tell me what to tell Jens. Um, I don't know. Good job, I suppose. By the way, Norwegians are awesome. They, uh, my snus comes from Norway, and that's an interesting story. Apparently, uh, apparently they uh, had for, for like changed the packaging laws for it, so all the packages have to be the same bland color. But uh, then the bland minimalistic design won some awards, so it's weird. I like this. Merle asks, adding to Bart, what about Wagner groups in Mali and Central African Republic? Ah, uh, yes. Well. They are staying there, but what we're talking about in these troops is that they've been promised some things, they're on some mines and everything. It's going to be a complex situation. I think someone's going to take over, maybe. We're going to see some local fights, struggles. In a way, it was promised that Prigozhin would kind of want to go to Africa, but now he's in Belarus. And that stuff makes money, depending on the, how the warlords work out, work out. That's a complex issue. I'm going to definitely keep an eye out on Wagner guys in Mali and Central African Republic. But it's one of those things where I can't give you precise predictions exactly at this point. I'm really interested in what's going to happen with them. I haven't forgotten about them. But uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll be doing that. Another question. One of Lavrov's dep deputies traveled to Syria to assure Assad of continued support by Wagner troops. What does this say about any plans Russia has with Wagner? Uh, nothing. Nothing at all. He, he might have said Wagner. He might have said anything else. He might have just mentioned Wagner to look nice. Assad is in a bit of a pickle now as well. Because you see, uh, I think recently uh, Syria stepped into this League of Arab Nations. And, uh, well, see, Putin is a peace guarantor there so that other nations don't mess with, with uh, Assad. If you remember also... Um, in the Armenian and Azerbaijan, there is that conflict where Azerbaijan, during this, this whole coup stuff, basically cut off and encircled a bunch of Russian so-called peacekeeper troops. But people in Central Asia and in Africa and other places are noticing that, yeah, just because you well, you have had Putin as your you know big daddy, and doesn't mean he's going to help you out now. And Putin's kind of worried about that situation as well. For example, this is why uh, the ODSC organization in, in, in Tokayev, in Kazakhstan, told Putin to deal with all this, all this mess himself because, you know, they have uh, their buddies in China going on there. So that's great. Uh, what do I think the EU... How do I think the EU will react to the end of the war with, with the Ukrainian victory with the possible mass immigration of Russians if Russia is still somehow standing? Oh, boy. That thing is interesting. That thing is very interesting. I don't... <sighs> Look, they're going to come here, probably. There's going to be a lot of counter-agents. There's going to be a huge mess over there. There's going to be a ton of refugees. The problem is that, um, well, we already have issues with Belarusians and everything. And I don't know. I don't know how we're going to deal with uh, these things. We're going to have to have some help. These people are going to have to be vetted, definitely. There's going to have to be a denazifying process, to be honest. There's going to be have to, There's going to be something... To basically show them that, you know, just because you have now mess in your own country, you have to understand why this happened and that, you know, this is not a random place where you can go over. And a lot of people like in liberal opposition, which, by the way, interestingly enough, is why I disagree with Maxim Katz. Those of you who probably follow Bellingcat and other, other places know this guy. He draws all the wrong conclusions about everything all the time. For example, he stated that the fact that uh, the United States clearly made sure that Putin knows that West is not involved in the coup attempt, he thought that it meant that the United States and all of Europe want to keep Russia in one piece. I don't know how he made this decision. But he also states that, you know, all these Russian migrants that are net positive, everyone's, you know, doing well, the economy, economy is growing and everything. But at the same time, I'm reading comments from Georgians and, and Kazakhi people who state that, well, only the rich Russians emigrated to their countries and now the, like, prices for apartments is going up and they're like pushing out people from the local markets and the economical benefits of all these Russians are limited at best. So it's going to be complex. We're going to have to deal with this. Of course, you're going to have uh, some very far right European parties uh, who will welcome them with open arms just because they're white. But that's going to be iffy because those guys are primary candidates, if not denazified and not explained to join like 
total skinhead groups. And I'm not saying Eurosceptics, I'm, I'm saying open, blatant skinheads who just beat people up. A lot of them are going to be that way, definitely. You guys who were with me and maybe watched the whole whole two and a half hours, uh, a bit more than that, of the Gidkin and, and Friends Club, yeah, we do uh, watch-alongs here on Discord, dear listeners, so you can come on. I think you saw how, how full of hate they are, these people. And, and it's a messy situation anyways. So there is going to be some aid needed for, for us as well here or to, you know, take a look at them and vet them and figure out what to do with them. But I think, I think the, the refugee is going to be, the refugee thing is going to be solved a bit different way. I rather think that they, they're going to split off their country in regions. For example, people in Karelia will want to want to join Finland and, and the guys in Ivan Gorod, which is the opposite of Narva, will decide to, to make that one city. I think even here in Latvia, we have a Pitalova district. And I think people in Kurils will just want to join Japan. That's my likely scenario. The refugees, I don't even know. The, another refugee crisis, but weird because this time the far right, who are usually anti-immigration, will be super pro because they're going to get more people there. Because we have noticed the fact that a lot of them have extremely racist tendencies to the point where, to the point where, where, where we now have issues with our Indian Pakistani immigrants who are afraid to go to certain regions and like certain regions of Riga at night where there are majority Russians who have been you know, very aggressive lately, and they truly just wait until your bold vault courier arrives and then they beat you up. Uh, I am following this problem as well, and we're dealing with this together with uh, some of my um, friends. Yes. Now, what else do we have here? Do you think that there will have to be some NATO intervention after Russia will collapse? There will be nukes in the hands of World Wars? Oh, definitely. Um, not primarily directly, but I think there's going to be something that needs to be done. But I, I think that what needs to be made clear is that NATO should not involve itself in the collapse. It should involve itself only when requested by someone who has legitimate authority. And I have no idea who might have that one in each of these segments. In my personal opinion, is Moldova's and Georgia's EU NATO membership directly tied to the outcome of the war, aka Ukraine winning? Uh, not, not necessarily. Not necessarily, though. One thing that I don't get is what's up with Transnistria. Because... I think I think that also might be changing. Because you see, Moldova and Romania, they're the same peoples. Literally, there are there are no nationality or ethnicity of being a Moldovan, as far as I, I, I have learned from everyone, including Moldovans themselves. They're all basically Romanians, except different kinds of Romanians. Speak the same language. Moldovan language is basically Romanian. They just call it Moldovan. It's just... But the problem is Moldova has these regions with minorities in them, and they, they would want to integrate, but then they also wouldn't. It's a, it's a huge mess. But Transnistria is a basically a their own Donetsk, their own Donbass. And I'm not sure why Moldova and Romania haven't just decided to, you know, walk in there, get the ammo dumps and supplies that are locked in there, a lot of them, and just take over because there aren't that many Russian troops in there. Then again, I suppose that would mean sort of a war or something, but see, Transnistria is not even recognized as a country by Russia itself at all. It's kind of like they haven't even admitted it exists as, as some sort of important thing, and they could just go in and, and I don't know, say, Russian citizens, you can please leave or something. It's a, it's a Donbass, but in, in worse situation. I, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd rather think that they could hasten it, but again, people are doing their political stuff. It's all bizarre, because everyone things that this Transnistria situation where there are ammo stockpiles and everything, well, that's a big, big painful issue, but who knows? I'm not an expert of that stuff. And then uh, I have two more questions that I want to answer. First, we had the fog of war during the Ukrainian offensive, then Prigozhin came. Twitter seems almost useless now, useless now to follow the news. Too foggy. What to do with Twitter? Well, I kind of have to be on Twitter. On Twitter, there's a lot of people whom I'm in contact with, and I exchange messages with, and I try to get a message out. But yeah, um, Again, come to Discord. I I figured that in Twitter, everything was like, I noticed that everyone was tweeting from sources, from from like uh, unverified this and verified that. It was all insanity and stupid. I just wanted to get away with this because every time someone says, I have buddy in, in Kremlin that I can call the who knows something, ugh, that's all nonsense. That was just nonsense. And, and serious channels were posting this and that was just so, so silly. Like, and people just tend to believe random things at random. We fact check everything here. So again, that night on, on Discord was insane and difficult and crazy. But Twitter has a lot of spaces, a lot of people talking. It has its place, but uh, 
I'm not a huge fan, not a very huge fan of this personally, especially because people also can just, for example, I had to report a guy who just tried to attach some ads on, on everything I posted. Twitter is, an, Twitter is a nice place, but you have to, you know, scar for information there. The problem is Twitter is taken seriously enough by people so that if I want some Latvian sponsors, I need to get my follower count up until to like 10,000 or so. They won't even like bother because they only check my Twitter account, like followers there. So that's why I'm pushing up on Twitter. I hope to get to five five k sometime this month, and then I have to post something, uh, something kind of more viral to go out of this situation. Now the people are asking where's Prigozhin and everything, but yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Does anyone has? Oh, people are stating that. Uh, Prigozhin seems to be missing a finger. Oh no, that's that's not true. I don't, I don't believe he's missing a finger. I'm looking at pictures. Oh no. Oh, well, he actually is. I'm not sure if this was there all the time, or wasn't it? But um, could could and could basically mean that he's made some deal with uh, the prisoner guys who are also, you know, de- in this whole mess and felt like he's betrayed them a bit. Dealings with. Uh, very legitimate businessman. There's precautions from one of that one of those places. That's that's weird. Could be, could be. But uh, again, I'm I'm gonna have to double check on this one. I'd rather double check than you know say something that I know no that I don't know about. Oh, and also while I'm on Twitter, yeah, I like to hang out on on, on Miria Report. I said Maya Report previously on, on Miria Report. But uh, I I sat down there for a whole night and understood that I like I like when Domen is online the best. Domen Preshen, a, Slo- a Slovene, is the best host that there is because I stayed up all night when there were like when they were doing this in American time zones, and it turned out that they're very formal about this stuff. Maria, yes, thank you. I I can't pronounce that word at all, but uh, yeah, Domen Preshen is reliable when he's on. You go and listen to that. Uh, the American side of the the whole picture is they they like to point their theories and everything. And that's also the reason. Oh, yeah. And another question that was from email, which I wanted to save for last because that's an important one. What's my beef with the uh, Institute for Study of War? Well, I'll tell you what's my beef with those guys, which is why I recommend that people, you know, be careful when calling them. Again, uh, if you read my article about prison culture, you know that they just miss the cultural stuff a lot. They use secondary sources, and I highly doubt that they have anyone on their team that actually can speak Russian or Ukrainian. At least I haven't seen anyone. And they're late. And then they make errors, and then they then they also treat uh, some rumors as facts. Uh, they they listen to what Kolashenkov says from Russian Ministry of Defense. I mean, sure, they're an academical facility organization, but I don't know. They're making way too many mistakes, and they're ignoring way too much of the cultural stuff. And they're well late and unreliable, and their weird news are just weird sometimes. I don't know. They're, if you want a purely academical United States outfit that does things as a research institute, fine, great. I'm pretty sure they're better in other conflicts. But in this one, I don't know. I shouldn't be poking holes at the things that they post occasionally and the stuff that they miss. But I'd be happier if people, you know, quoted me instead of them. But I'm not a massive institute with huge audiences. And I've tried to help them out. I honestly sent them an email explaining what's happening and everything. So, pff, yeah, it's a, it's a mess here. I I hope they'd hire me at one point, and if someone is listening of from them or has contacts with them, I'd I'd be glad to help. For example, today I had a day off; I could do work with this. Uh, British intelligence, by the way, um, they're a bit they're a bit better. They don't post everything as much with, with all the map stuff and everything. <laughs> this is why, by the way, on Twitter I post when I post ISV maps, I also post the rebar maps so that you can combat com, com, contrast and compare. Ah, now it's getting a bit dry. But, you know, they have to fill these updates, but I don't know. I, I've stopped using them. The thing is that um, the biggest issue why I have a dislike and what I want, why I want them to be more competent is the fact that a lot of Russian opposition analysts, those journalists who moved abroad, right, they like to quote the same Institute for Study of War or New York Times and point at their mistakes and how they don't understand things to basically say that, oh, stupid Westerners, they are, are, their analysis is stupid and wrong. And that kind of includes me as well. Because for unknown reasons, they just lump me in with all of them. And, and they just, that's why they also sometimes refuse to work. And that's why they have this, what they haven't understood is uh, these Russian liberal opposition journalists, they make the West look silly and stupid. 
in the press part at least. And they often mock it with their own theories about how everything should be done. And they don't understand that this causes distrust and will harden any integration with any kind of more liberal, pro-democratic Russian pop population with the Western media and everything closer to that as well. They're causing more troubles in the future. They have the same attitude as they were previously going on about condescendingly stating everyone in Russia that they are the smart ones because they do this and everyone else is dumb. And that's just so silly. And I have to figure out how to work with them. Yeah, I'll take one more question. I see that someone is typing it. I'll check other rooms. Maybe I have missed something and someone missed the chat thing. But yeah, uh, dear listeners, we'll be making such things more often. Sometimes at least when I can do these can do these talks. Normally this won't happen, especially when, when I'm going to be in, in uh, more dangerous situations. I'd like to also mention, by the way, about that stuff, because we have a fundraiser going on, which I will find for you. because. Uh, the German, we have some funding from the YouTube channel who promised to give us some money. I haven't received any money from them, but the YouTube channel will give us some money to fund fuel and everything, but that's only parts of the cost. And I'm working with these German journalists and they have made a fundraiser for all this stuff. And I'll open this. Um, <laughs> there's a GoFundMe called uh, Help Me Go to the Ukraine and Shoot a Documentary by Viktor Nordland, who's going to go with me and with his cameraman, and they're from Wuppertal, and their city's helping them out. But uh, he's also raising funds to, to aid all this process of me going to Ukraine. I have some funding reserved from you, your patrons, and some funding from other people, but there's a GoFundMe. We, he's raised 175 euros from 3,000 goal. That would fix our budget and allow us to stay for longer and, and do more, th more, more stuff. I will, of course, include this in the show notes, but hey, um, Help me help keep them alive, because because uh, Victor Nordland and his buddy are Germans, and they're great. I'm gonna have to help them deal with all the difficulties, and it's gonna be on my nerves and everything. So you know, uh, time to help out before we go. Hopefully, it's gonna be great. Also, Philip, happy birthday to you. That's nice. And finally, what did I want to say? Moscow regrets the incident in Kramatorsk because all Colombian, Colombian citizens were involved. Oh, I'm confused about this one, Max Nert, at this point. Sorry. But uh, so, so there was some incident in Kramatorsk. Oh, that's the Kramatorsk one. Colombian citizens were injured. Yeah, well, Kramatorsk is just another situation there, and it's, it's all weird. In Z channels, by the way, when, um, when Russia hits some civilian target, they are, they're like saying, oh, evil Kiev regime using human shields. When there are civilian casualties from Ukrainian strikes, and they do happen, they're like, oh, evil Kyiv regime is now targeting civilians. It's just always weird. Always, always just different. Help me go to Ukraine and shoot a documentary. Yes, that's the thing. But yeah, I'll post that as we go. Right now, it's about midnight here. This episode's been a bit long. I hope it was interesting. Next time, if you want to be on this one, because I'm going to do these questions and answers, I think, once a month. Um, Patreons get the priority, of course. You can message me there. You can message me an email. You can just come in and hang out on Discord. I'll publish this one as well because uh, we have a pretty ne pretty decent uh, community. And uh, I like to especially advertise the fact that they help me out. You guys here help me out with um, watching the most traumatic of Russian propaganda stuff. Some of you even have endured for many hours. So I hope that's going to be that's going to be neat. And now I have to figure out how to how to make this how to make this uh, thing stop. But okay, yeah. As usual, sorry for the weird thing. Of, of course, patrons will not be charged for this episode. It's a Q and A, and it's recorded on Discord. До свидания, товарищи. If you are listening to this and are not on Discord, please come join in. We're going to have things here. Consider clicking the donate button on the Eastern Border.lv homepage. Um, we have crypto wallets there as well. patreoncom slash Eastern Border. And I hate monetizing all this stuff. I, I wish ACOS would give me a better deal, but they don't. And as usual, happiness is mandatory. That's the Daniel